Um, first of all, there's some, some important information you have to know. What I'm going to do is I'm going to um, sort of give you some food for thought. This is a speculative type of, uh, of, of talk that, uh, where I'm going to use in the if word, the should, the could, the would, the might have word, words that historians don't use ever. They don't use that word. Um, they're perfectly serviceable words. I like them a lot, and I'm going to use them. So keep in mind that this is guesswork that I'm, I'm going to give you now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a whole bunch of different areas that seem to be disparate, that seem to be not related to each other, and ram them together, <laughs> and then hopefully come out with some grand synthesis. Uh, something that you don't really talk about much in abduction research because we don't know enough about it to have a grand synthesis, as you'll soon see. Um, but I can't just do that. I've got to show you what the abduction phenomenon looks like a little bit. So this is not exactly abductions 101. It's, let's call it abduction light. It's, it's very simple stuff. And we'll just start off with, uh, what do I have here? OK, a new definition of abductions. There have been a bunch of definitions of abductions, of abductions. All of them fall short some way or another. What I've done is simplified a lot of them and, uh, and, and, and actually expanded on a few of them. It's real-time physical and cognitive interaction between aliens and or hybrids who mentally control humans either on board a UFO or in a normal environment. And that covers absolutely everything in the abduction phenomenon. It's a, it's a simple little thing. It only took me about 5,000 years to figure out, but it, was a, it, it fell into place after many, many different versions of this. And then having my wife look it over and say, what does this mean? And now, the abduction phenomenon, as we know it, kind of came to prominence early on. In 1957, there was the Antonio Villas-Boas case. Antonio Villas-Boas, as we uh, learned back in the uh, 1960s, was an illiterate Brazilian peasant who one night was uh, working on his uh, tractor and dunking flying saucers from outer space. And he was taken into it against his will. And this was done to him, and that was done to him, and this was done, and that was done. And then he was taken into the room, and there was a, a weird-looking female, naked as a jaybird. And um, she looked pretty good, not bad. He kind of liked her a lot. But she kind of growled when he talked, which turned him off. But that didn't matter. He jumped on her and made mad, passionate love. Then he jumped on her again, made mad, passionate love, even though she growled and he was repulsed by it. And then she left, and she pointed to her stomach and, uh, and pointed up. And he said he felt like he was being used as a stallion for their, uh, to improve their stock or for their stock or something like that. This case was, of course, totally nuts to the people of 1957, 58, and 59 who looked at this. And it was not even published until 1966. It was just beyond the pale. It wasn't just that he was kidnapped by aliens. It had things that people didn't want to hear about. They didn't want to see. They didn't want to even think about. So uh, that case lay dormant. It wasn't until 1986 when I personally learned that Antonio Villas-Boas wasn't some illiterate Brazilian peasant. His father was apparently a well-to-do landowner. He was uh, either taking a correspondence course, he was enrolled somewhere, whatever, but he became an attorney. And uh, everything we learned about him was wrong, in essence. Um, and this seems to go hand in hand with the UFO and abduction phenomenon, actually. Then there was a Barney and Betty Hill case. If there isn't anybody here who've, who's heard of them, um, I, I would be amazed. This is probably the most famous case of all cases, you know, and uh, of all abduction cases. An interracial couple driving blah, 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 go, going here, going in Portsmouth, New, they're heading towards Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I'm not going to go into all these details. They're abducted. Cut to the quick. Uh, and taken on board this UFO. They're separated into different rooms. Things happened to them. One thing was uh, Barney Hill had a sperm sample taken from him. 
that was interesting. <laughs> As in, what, huh? Okay. Betty said when they put a needle in her navel that, uh, that, that they told her it was a pregnancy test. That almost certainly was not what they said, actually. I hate to say that, Kathy, if you're here, um, because uh, we know what that is, and that is not a pregnancy test. It's uh, an egg removal test of the ovaries. But the fact is, though, that uh, then they were released, and unlike uh, Antonio Villas-Boas, they, they didn't remember what had happened to them, whereas Villas-Boas did remember. Still, uh, it was, you know, you're looking for patterns, you're looking for lots of people saying, and, and, and there was a case here and a case there in the 60s, uh, Betty and Betty Hill case. Oh, I have 1957 here, that's wrong, it's 1961, I'm sorry, gosh. How did that get through? You know, I better get rid of that as soon as possible. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was 1961, so you have uh, Antonio Villasbos in 57, and uh, Barney and Betty in 61. Now, the... The abduction phenomenon starts sometimes with a UFO sighting, sometimes not. People are in their bed, they're watching television, they're, they're, doing, they're, they're doing other things, and suddenly they find themselves being lifted up and, and, and out. This is, uh, all these drawings are gonna be done by abductees. There's a guy who sees a UFO, he, he told me he'd just been dropped off by a friend and he was heading into the front, this is his front yard, he was heading into his house, but he looked over to his left and there was a, uh, a, uh, this UFO hovering in the woods. That's how they start. If a UFO is close up and you're standing right near it, it's there for a reason. It's there for a reason and so are you. And consequently, this is typical of abduction material. Uh, what we found is that UFO sightings, particularly close encounter sightings, are far less random than we ever imagined. It's not just, oh, the guy saw something close up. The question is, why did the guy see something close up? That's, that's the question. Here's a car stoppage thing. Uh, this is a guy um, uh, who, uh, here's where I, I start expanding on my time. I'll tell you a story of, of what I was here. People say, you know, I saw this UFO, I was driving along, and off to the right there was this UFO, and it was hovering up in the sky, and it came down, and it was over this field, and it was like amazing. And I pulled over to the side of the road to get a better look, and the next thing I knew, that thing just flew away at fantastic speed. And I heard that over and over and over and over again. And I thought to myself, why in the hell is he pulling off to the side of the road to get a better look? They're all saying that. You can just crawl along and get a better look. You can do, there's a lot of ways. What I found is, what the, this, is this is what I call abductee speak. What the abductee is saying is, I was driving along at the, uh, and I saw this UFO, and that was amazing, it was astounding. It was off to the side of the road, hovering above a field, and I, uh, I had to pull over to the side of the road now. <laughs> and then I waited. And then this being came out and opened the door and I went out and then they lifted me in and uh, I went in and then they did this the UFO and they did this, that, this, that, this, that, this, that, this, that. And then I came back down and I got back into the car and turned the engine on and wow, that thing just flew away at fantastic speed. <laughs> so when you hear that, if you're a researcher, you know, well, maybe he did just pull over to the side of the road and everything was fine, but at the Maybe not, you know. This is one of these kinds of situations. This is a guy, I shall go to the pointer, who is a graphic artist, and he drew a sort of tableau, in a way, of, uh, of, of where he was. He was with a friend, and uh, this is the guy. And he sees, i to move my microphone over here. He sees a, uh, a UFO up there. And the next thing you know, it scares him. He's like 12 years old. The two of them, he and his friend, hide in a ditch. Then they decided they will stand up and wait. <laughs> That's him going up into the object. When he returned a couple of hours later, his friend had already gone home. His friend wasn't taken, but that's him. That's, that's 
you know, it's a daytime event. Uh, people are abducted that, that way all the time. Uh, it's nothing unusual. They're taken in, and there's usually a waiting area. And I'm skipping an awful lot of things here. You've got to remember, this is a very complex subject, and I'm not even alluding to, to things that happen even before they're in the waiting room. But they get to the waiting room. And their clothes are usually removed. This is a good example of one that has alcoves. Most of them just have, has a ledge around it, uh, just a ledge that goes just sort of around it like that, all the way around the room. And they can sit there, glassy-eyed, staring at somebody across from them who's sitting there, glassy-eyed, staring down maybe. But they can describe who else is there. That's the important thing. You can ask them, oh, well, are you, do you see kids? Do you see men, women? Do you see, you know? You can ask them about uh, uh, ethnic groups, racial groups, wh wh whatever. You know, you can you can ask those kinds of questions to see what kind of mix there is and all that. And um, next, here's a guy walking down a corridor. Now this has confabulation in it. That is to say, this is a consciously remembered event. That means it is not to be trusted. It is exactly the opposite of what you think. Consciously remembered events, generally speaking have a lot of false, wrong material. It's not that the person is saying that on purpose. This is what they sort of remember. For example, this square entranceway here or whatever, that's just not on board a UFO. It's just not there. You're not going to see it. It's not there. Uh, nobody ever describes that. Who is not confabulating? <laughs> and um, he seems to be wearing a black outfit. Probably not. The aliens' heads, they're too wide. But it's a good drawing. I like this drawing because it shows what's happening. He's, he's walking down a hall and he's being led by, by two uh, small gray aliens. Uh, here's another one. Here's, uh, if I may use the pointer. This woman enters into the object here. She goes into here. Here's a waiting area. They take her clothes off. She walks into... Uh, where the heck does she walk? Into I think she walks into here next, and this is her this is her table right here. Afterwards, she went into here, and she was presented with a baby to hold. And I have a slide of that also. Here's another one diagram of hallways, uh, and uh, the guy walks down this hallway, that hallway, this hallway, that hallway, and uh, this is him here at his uh, on his table. There's only three tables in that room, you'll notice. Now, one of the things that happens to all abductees, almost all the time, is something that when I taught this course, I would have a student, I, I would say, tell me what happens to every single abductee almost every time. See if anybody can guess this. And not a single human ever, ever guessed it. Only the aliens sitting in class guessed it. They knew right away, but the humans <laughs> couldn't get it. And it's a staring procedure where a, a being of some sort stares directly into the open eyes of a person who cannot close his eyes, cannot avert his eyes, can't do anything like that. And I wondered for years what this was, and I finally figured out that they're connecting with the optic nerve and they're going through the optic nerve to innervate any, any uh, neural uh, uh, areas that, 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 that they want. And uh, there's a certain amount of evidence for that because people would, I won't go into it, people would feel certain things in their body and something's going down here and there's a buzzing here and there's, a, there's, and they would also have different images and imagination and, and I figured out what the images were and why and so forth. And, and it's, it's uh, the optic nerve is the only nerve that you can see from the outside. Now there is a distance between these aliens' eyes and your optic nerve. How do they do that? Do you say a lot of me? I don't know. But that's the only thing that I can think of and if that makes any sense. Here's uh, sperm extraction with neural engagement. See, the thing about Barney Hill was he had sperm taken from him. But when John Fuller wrote the book Interrupt the Journey, he had Fuller take that part out. It was too embarrassing. Thank God for that. Barney did the right thing because the bunkers couldn't say, well, Barney said it, so now all the guys are saying it, you know. The answer is, it happened to Barney, and it happens to almost all guys. 
and I'm saying almost because I tend to speak in absolutes, so I'm trying to learn how to say almost and most of and things like that. It's very hard. Um, <laughs> but um, here's a situation where a guy's having a, a neural engagement and sperm removed at the same time. Here's a guy who is having neural engagement with a young hybrid, we'll get to that later, who is wearing what I call hybrid garb. This is typical hybrid wear. This is what they wear. Here is uh, egg extraction, fetal insertion, or removal. In other words, women have eggs extracted in several different ways. They have uh, uh, fetuses inserted in them and fetuses removed, into them, uh, removed from them. Almost all women, there's the, there's the qualifiers again, almost all women have this. Uh, let's put it this way, I haven't found one yet that hasn't, but I'm sure that there probably is one. So uh, almost all women have this almost all the time. This is uh, taking a fetus away to a room, and I thought I was being clever here. I will invent a word for this called an incubatorium. And I found out when the internet reared its ugly head that uh, there already was a word called incubatorium. So. <laughs> So he's taking it to the incubatorium uh, to be placed in these things. These are, are containers made of, we would assume, a glass-like material, so that you can see inside. Almost certainly filled, well, filled with a liquid, but the liquid is almost certainly a nutrient. And what you see here is fetuses in different stages of development waiting to be taken out or hatched. Uh, I don't know what word to use for that, but uh, it certainly is not their birthday. That, that's, <laughs> that's not a concept with these, these particular people. Okay, now you'll see this is what I call, what I've done, and once again, this is why this is abductions light. I, I need to zoom through this. What I've done is, in Secret Life, uh, my book Secret Life, no. In the books The Threat, I, I took hybrids and I, and I decided that they were on a sort of continuum. I, I was probably wrong about that, but I was in the right ballpark. So I had early stage, middle stage, and late stage hybrids, depending on the degree of hybridization. My guess is that it's more subtle than that, and there are stages in between each. And I've identified two more stages since that time, which I will talk about today. Bud Hopkins first discovered this in 1983. He said, he called me up, he said, David, I found the most amazing case, the most astounding case, the unbelievable case, that was most amazing. I said, God, what, 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 what is it? What, what, what happened, you know? And so he said, well, you remember Chris? I said, yeah. And he said, well, they had her, they, they took her into the room and they showed her a baby. I said, uh, a baby? Huh? Yeah, it was a weird looking baby, like sort of a cross between a human and an alien. It was a weird looking baby. Well, the point is, is that you did not say the word baby and flying saucer in the same sentence. You know, that's just, that's not a word that UFO researchers used a whole heck of a lot. Baby. So, yeah, they wanted her to hold the baby, he said. And then they wanted her to feed the baby. And I said, Feed the baby. <laughs> what are you talking about? I said, did she tell them that she doesn't have, had, has never had children, is not pregnant, is not lactating, she can't feed the baby, you know? And, they, and he said, yeah, she told them she couldn't feed the baby. They said, that doesn't make any difference. It's okay, just, just, just take the baby, put the baby to your, to your breast. So she did. And I thought to myself at that time, if this is true, if this is happening, and I had not started doing my own uh, uh, abduction uh, hypnosis until a few years later, if, if this is true, we will never be able to understand how these aliens think because they value form over function. The form is you put the baby to a woman's breast. The function is not there. There's no milk. That was wrong. The woman's lactating, whether they know it or not. The baby will, in fact, feed. And, uh, and we, we, know we, can, we can identify the procedures even for, for stimulation for that. 
next. Here is an early to middle stage hybrid. Oh, let me just show here. This is an early stage hybrid because she has an alien shaped face. She has whites in her eyes, but they're mainly black. She has very thin, wispy hair, and she's wearing hybrid guard. Here is a baby. It's hard to tell. Uh, the, the woman who, who did this pointed out to me that this here and this here, and there was actually, you can't really tell, but there's whites in this baby's eyes. And he had very, very thin hair. But then again, babies have thin hair, you know. But you'll notice he, that, uh, like the previous one, pointed chin, little tiny mouth, little tiny nose, little tiny ears. Here's another one. This one is even more difficult to tell. She put in all black. That's not possible, because if it was all black, it would be an alien. But there would be whites in the eyes. This is actually hair up here. He has, the mouth is a little too long, uh, but uh, a thin mouth, a very small um, nose, and in the ears, uh, just a, um, uh, a hole, essentially. This is a female hybrid toddler with confabulation. That is to say, this was sent to me by an anonymous person, I think from Las Vegas, now that I think about it, uh, many years ago. And here's a, a, a typical hybrid. I like this uh, quite a lot. Uh, the, uh, I'll use my cursor for this, I guess. If only I could. There it is. Uh, there's whites in the eyes, very thin, wispy hair, pointed chin, tiny little mouth, tiny little nose, hybrid garb. The confabulation is the head is too big for the body. The body can't support a head that size. It's, it's too big. That's... But that's what struck her the most. This is consciously remembered, you know. So, now, here, if I can use, find the cursor again, this is the hybrid. I'm strike that. This is the abductee. And this is a little toy that she's playing with. And here's some uh, probably middle or maybe even late stage hybrids. I don't know. But they, they're, you'll notice they're wearing hybrid garb. Uh, they're wearing hybrid clothes. And uh, she's and they're teaching her how to play with this thing. I wrote a paper, and this is amazing to me, but I wrote an article for IUR just on hybrid toys. And I, I, even now I think to myself, how can I do that? How, how, how can anybody do that if this is not happening? I wrote an article just on the toys they use because they're all characteristically the same and they're off the wall. Uh, uh, Anyway, that's a toy. Here is the abductee. Now, the abductee is wearing something there. Maybe, maybe not. Most abductees do not wear clothes. She's got her own doll. They had her bring her dolly and a milk bottle. This is a middle-stage uh, caretaker, female. This is probably an, in, an insect-like one, and I have a new word for that, insectolin. Uh, in insectolin, these are uh, probably middle to late, later stage, uh, probably, well, because of the hair, maybe middle stage uh, hybrid children. And they have dolls too, but they're like very skinny little rag dolls. And she's teaching them how to play with a doll. You rock it back and forth, you give it something to eat, you put it on your shoulder, you pat its back, you know, and that's how you play dolly, uh, and, and so forth. But what you're looking at here is an instruction situation. This young child, who's maybe six or seven, is teaching these other young kids how to do something that humans do. Now, remember that toy we saw? The woman, the girl picked it up and started shaking it. And immediately the middle stage hybrid said to him, No, don't do that, don't do that. And the little girl said, Here, don't do that. And here's their rag dolls. It was the same group. And here's her doll. <laughs> Just to show you that every once in a while, a kid can do something like that and adults don't. I won't go into why that happens, but there's, there's a neurological reason. Human woman comforts man on table, it says. Here's a man having sperm taken from him. Here's a, an abductee 
who's come over and is calming him. Now, what you're looking at here, she, he, this is the graphic artist here uh, um, uh, who did uh, his first one here, his second one. Uh, this is him standing where he actually helps with a, a woman who was uh, on there. Uh, oh, oops, sorry. How did, how did that happen? I'll get to that in a second. And uh, so what you're looking at here is an abductee who was helping aliens perform tasks. It's not a very big deal. Just sort of calming him. And this is like I call this calming behavior by abductees. Am I at the 15 minute mark yet? Uh, now, here's one where an abductee is taken into a room and shown a screen. Screen-like device. You'll notice off to the side here, on the right-hand side, there's a bunch of hybrid children, and there's another abductee sitting there. They're looking at her. This, he thinks, is a female alien, a gray alien, perhaps. But there are all these little kids around him, too. He's staring up. Now, what do people see on screens? Everything from the earth cracking in half, armies warring, bad news things happening, death, pestilence, uh, floods, whatever, and normal scenes of everyday life, uh, scenes of uh, people uh, uh, having a good time, uh, beautiful, verdant wilderness scenes, scenes of strange objects slowly floating, geometrically shaped across a screen that they're supposed to watch. Why this is being seen, I do not know. In other words, we used to think, oh, maybe it's predictive. Maybe the Earth will be hit by a meteor like somebody saw and crack in half. Maybe atomic bombs will go, all over, go, go off all over the place and, uh, and, and it'll be death to us all. I do not think it's predictive. It's not predictive. It is not, there's a lot of reasons for why it's not predictive. So. But the most important things that people see They'll see these average everyday scenes. And sometimes they'll be in a, in a large place with a, a, a screen in front of them. All communication is telepathic on board these objects, as we all know. And um, they'll look at the screen, and it's a picnic. And this is an actual event. I've talked about this in the media before. It's, it's an actual event. Uh, an actual picnic, rather, and, um, and there's people who are just standing around and gabbing, and there's a picnic table, and there's people who are maybe playing ball or, you know, or, you know throwing the ball to each other or something like that. It's just normal, absolutely normal. And they hear in their mind's ear, can you tell the difference between you and us? And the abductee looks up and says, huh? What do you mean, difference? Everybody looks the same to me. Uh, what? And they say, see, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? Soon we will all be together. Soon there'll be a change coming. Everybody will know his place. Everybody will be happy. Well, for a good UFO abduction researcher, when you hear something like that once, you can't, you, you gotta wait for verification from other people who say the same thing and are unaware that this has already been said. And I got that a lot. And then people began, to, beings began to talk about this change that's coming. The change is coming, the change is coming soon, soon, soon. It's gonna come soon. And everybody's gonna be, it's gonna be wonderful. You're gonna love it, the change is coming. And I began to think, what the heck does the change mean? And what does the word soon mean? Is soon like tomorrow or a million years from now? You know, what is it? It's a relative term, this soon means nothing. Here is a woman who was involved in a rescue mission. This is extremely typical. Not the event that you're looking at, but the rescue concept for reasons that I do not know or understand. I don't know why abductees will describe saving a baby in the midst of uh, an earthquake where there's rubble all over the place, saving uh, uh, another kid somewhere in some horrendous trouble. I, I, don't, I don't understand that, but we do get these rescue things. Now, in this situation, if you look at the cursor right around here, these are humans. This guy here is an alien. This is 
the operating system for a flying saucer. She's dressed in hybrid garb. How's that for something odd? Here is a little gray alien. He says, these humans are chasing one of ours, uh, one of us. You have to maneuver the UFO on top of the, on, uh, of the alien so the alien can escape. Uh, if I can find the curse again. So the alien can escape. She says, well, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. He says, yes, you do, yes, you do. And she looks over at these symbols and stuff. She says, oh, oh, yeah, I, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. And she puts her hands on top of these things. And you can see the, she said, you can see this, this fake UFO, this is a, it's not actually happening, but it's moving closer over the, uh, the alien, and that's good enough, the, guy, so the, the little guy says, okay, that's fine, that's fine, I'll come this way now. What is this for? Beats the heck out of me. Now here is a middle stage hybrid, uh, he's got hair, he's got uh, uh, not as pronounced a pointed chin, he's got a regular mouth, a regular nose, He's got lots of whites in his uh, eyes. And this is, the, and the, he's looking at the abductee who's lying on a couch, or uh, lying on, a, uh, on a, some sort of device. And this is actually a street map. And her job is to stand on the corner when panicked human beings come running down the street. Her job is to say, everything is okay, everything is fine, just keep going this way, just walk this, this, this way, calm down, everything is okay. That will be her job. And I have several people who have told me this, not knowing that anybody else would ever on there in their lives say anything like that, but they're the same. And, and I don't even want to think about what that means, you know what I mean? <laughs> Let's just let that one go. Okay, now, is there, okay. The thing is that when you get early, when you get early, middle, late stage hybrids, there's more. There is a human stage hybrid who is concerned about security. This is a drawing of one. The mouth is a little bit turned down. It was accidentally drawn that way. And he didn't actually look like that. But it makes him look a little sinister, and that's OK. He is not a human stage hybrid. And I have a new word for that, too, hubrid, which I'll describe in a second. Because neurologically, he can only think about one thing, and that is protecting hybrids from harm. That is all he thinks about and nothing else. He is, has a function, and that is his function. He cannot operate outside of that function, which is why I'm just calling him human stage, because from the outside, this guy looks human. Here is what I call a hybrid. Uh, this one here is, has got longish hair, is, looks human in absolutely every way, acts human in every way, is human, acts human, except for one little tiny thing, the neurology aspect. See, here's the deal. These things are falling. Here's the deal. All abductees, without exception, are controlled first from a distance. In order for there to be an abduction phenomenon, the person who's about to be abducted cannot know that they're going to be abducted. And when it begins, they can't say to themselves, somebody's coming into my house. I'll reach behind my pillow, get out my 9 millimeter Glock, and blow their heads off. They just can't do that. Nor can they dial 911, nor can they wake up their wife or their husband, uh, nor, nor can they get the dog to attack, you know, spot, get them, get them. Uh, they can't do anything like that. They just sit there waiting. They are already controlled and from a distance. That is neurological control. How far that distance is, we don't know. Is it six trillion light years from here on the edge of the universe where they can control people? Probably not. Is it 50 feet? Well, probably so, yeah. How far it extends, we don't know. Uh, but I, my guess is that this is a far more complicated situation than I know. Um, it's odd for that to be complicated, but there's reasons for it. 
so uh, this hubrid can control humans, and humans cannot control the hubrid. That's the one difference. Now, the ramifications of that are that hubrids are another species than, than humans. Hubrids are a first-class species, and humans are a second-class species. That's the way it works when somebody can control somebody else. That's just the way life becomes. And uh, I don't particularly like that, see? Call me crazy, but it just doesn't set right with me, you know? I want to be able to control them. That's the way it's supposed to work. But uh, that is not what we are finding out, uh, as it turns out. Here's a female Hubert, now the person who did this did this on a computer, and he didn't add the neck in. So you have to imagine that there's actually uh, a couple of um, where we might to, a couple of lines coming down here uh, to give her a normal normal neck. Also able to control people. Now let's talk about aliens. In my research. My sense is that the insect-like ones, the insectoid beings, or as I just call them, insectolins, it's insect alien without an E. It's easy to remember. The insectolins are true aliens. These are, these are ordered givers. These are the powers that be, I think. These are the ones, I surmise, are at the top of the pecking order. There really isn't a pecking order. It's more like spokes of a wheel. But they're in the center of it. And they look really weird. You notice how thin they are, how thin their arms are. You notice that their head is odd. This is actually a, a drawing by Katerina Wilson, who, who gave it to me. And, um, uh, and you see that uh, or the head is pointed. There's, there's no mouth, there's no nose, there's no ears, there's no nothing. And uh, really bizarre looking. Now, people call them parking meter heads. People call them praying mantises. That's the most common thing that, that, that uh, people say, um, and so forth. Then comes, and I don't have a slide of this because, you know, for various reasons. Then, then comes the reptilian-like ones, rep, reptoids. I just call them reptilins. It's a nice, easy word, R-E-P-T-A-L-I-N, reptilins. And we see reptilins once in a great while. And when people describe them, they describe them on a spectrum of, God, the guy looks like an alligator. God, the guy looks like he's a lizard. God, the guy looks like he's a tall gray. Oh, what? <laughs> They describe them all the way down. You know, it's like all over the place. It is so, it's, it's, it's not rare, but it's unusual to get them. Of the uh, uh, 11, 1,200 cases that I've looked at, you know, I have maybe 20 cases of people saying reptilin. And the question is, is this confabulation? Or, or not, and it's hard to tell. But let's assume there is. Let's assume there is. Now keep this in the back of your minds. I'm actually going to come back to it. Now, so they're, they're sort of at the top of the pecking order. Now these are small and tall grays. I'm going to just call them. I'm using the current vernacular grays, as opposed to saying gray aliens. We all know what, what, what it means to say gray. Small grays with confabulation. The confabulation is they're armored. The problem here is if they were armored, we would, we would hear this all the time. And this was drawn in 1987, I believe it was, or 88. And I never heard it again. There, therefore, it is confabulation. Uh, but yeah, there you, you see, there he is, his eyes, nose, mouth, and all that sort of stuff. Here's another one. I, I had people draw the front, the front, the side, the back. This is when I was first starting out. I started doing it at 86, by 88, 89, I had some people doing this. Tall grays, eyes, nose, mouth. Uh, here's, here's one, uh, the same thing, a tall gray. Uh, here's another one. This comes from Bud Hopkins' uh, collection of drawings. Uh, uh, here's another one. This, they're all pretty much the same. And here's another one from Bud Hopkins' uh, group. 
Um, and uh, this guy's wearing black, yes or no, maybe. Uh, here's another one, small gray. And here, here's another one, and I have a small gray. And I have a tall gray. Uh, OK, now, what's wrong with what I just told you? There's something wrong, something off kilter about what I just I showed you something. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Everything is great. Everything is wonderful. But it isn't, in my demented mind anyway. I kept looking at that, I kept because I knew early on that these beings didn't breathe. Because I asked people, well, when he's staring at you and his forehead is touching yours, can you feel his breath on your face? <laughs> the answer is no. Well, do you see his chest expanding, collapsing, even a little chest, a little expand, a little chest? No. There is no evidence whatsoever that they breathe. The second thing is, there's no evidence that they speak or that they eat orally, that they fuel themselves orally. There's evidence for other ways in which they do that, but not through the mouth. And since all communication is telepathic, they don't need no stinking mouth. So the question then is, why do these beings have these, maybe they're vestigial, maybe they sort of, over in the evolutionary world that they lived in, that they eventually uh, abandoned the nose, the mouth, and the ears, which I don't think we're ever going to do, because, you know, they come in handy. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, it just bothered me. It always bothered me. It just bothered me. It just didn't make sense. So then there comes the, rep the reptilians. OK. People say, oh, man, this, this one looks like a reptilian. Oh, he's horrible. He's ugly. Oh, get away from me. He's, he's going to harm me. Oh, he's horrible. He's, uh, I said, God, what, what, what is he doing? Oh, well, he's, 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 he's there. He's, 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 he's horrible. I hate him. I hate him. I said, well, is he, is he beating on you? You know, is he? <laughs> no. Well, is he harming you in any way? No. Well, is he threatening you? No. Well, what is he doing? Well, he's just doing uh, procedures that all the rest of them do. <laughs> in other words, but the very look of him is so threatening to the abductee that they, they, they recoil. But the activities of the reptilian are the same as everybody else. Keep that in the back of your mind. <laughs> now we turn to a completely different world, the world of words. The question then is, and here comes the disparate aspects of this, where I put, I've cobbled together two separate talks all together, one of which I've given a million times, and one of which you're hearing for the first time ever in my sweat-filled uh, way, because I'm nervous about this, about a new thought that I had. I don't have a lot of thoughts these days, but I actually had a thought a while ago. So, uh, so I, I've written this little thing up. The question is, are we alone in the universe? And as it says here, it, this is 10 years ago. This was a serious question. Now it's just a stupid question. You know, it's just, of, cor of course not, of course not, of course not. But there was, the problem is here is that we have 200 billion stars in our galaxy. There are 200 billion galaxies in the universe, although Michio Kaku says 100 billion. I was told by a professional astronomer, two and two is the number to go with. You know. But um, this, and so far over 1,000 planets have been discovered, not yet confirmed. There's about 350 that have been confirmed. And a few of them, maybe one or two, might be in the Goldilocks zone, where it's the temperature is good enough for uh, life to evolve, and uh, they don't, I'm not sure whether there's water on the planets or not, but, but, but the answer is that every single thing that astronomers have learned in the past 40 years, especially since the, Hel uh, the, the Hubble telescope went up uh, 30 years or whatever it is, has lent credence to the idea that there probably is life out there, and nothing has lent credence to the idea that we are alone in the universe. But In the year 2000, a book came out called The Rare Earth, which made a legitimate academic case that we are alone, at least in the galaxy and maybe the universe. And 
it's not just life they were talking about. Well, they're talking about technologically advanced life because sure, we're going to find microbes. It'll be the greatest find in, in, in mankind's history, and abduction researchers and UFO researchers are going to yawn, and that would be the appropriate response, you know. Because uh, we all know that, uh, that, 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 that well, we have a different, uh, I have a, speaking of myself, I have a different way of looking at the, at the universe, so to speak. Um, but what this said was that there was a combination of unusual events that took place on Earth that uh, made it unlikely that there could be another Earth-like planet. Sorry for the lack of the hyphen. And that means that the Earth got smashed by Mars, they think. It tilted it off its axis, which created seasons. There's uh, millions of years of comets smashing into the Earth, that, uh, each one containing ice, which created the oceans. We have a huge ocean-filled uh, planet with temperate uh, temperatures, and, uh, uh, and it goes on and on and on and on, and the, the destruction of the, the dinosaurs has allowed for primates to grow, uh, and it's a legitimate argument. In my opinion, and I think probably in most people's opinion, it's a nonsensical argument. It, doesn't, it's, it, it, it makes assumptions that can't be made. Uh, well, as I said, there's the size of our galaxy, which is gigantic, and there's the size of the universe. But now they're saying there's more universes. Maybe there's an infinite number of universes, which is very easy to, for me to understand. I, I can really get into that. Uh, when did the abduction program begin? See, this has nothing to do with what just came, what, just, what you just saw. It most likely started in the late 19th century. We can actually work backwards in terms of numbers. In other words, we know to a certain degree of high probability how many people are abductees or have had abduction-like experiences, maybe don't even know that they're abductees, but, but have had abduction-like experiences in their lifetimes. And it's somewhere between 2 and 5 or 6 percent, something like that. But the problem here is that, number one, it's global. This is not an American phenomenon. We do not have a corner on the abduction market, I'm sorry to say. We don't have a corner on a whole heck of a lot of markets these days. It is intergenerational. That is to say, if a person is abducted who's an abductee and marries a non-abductee and they have kids, it is most likely, and I'm choosing these words carefully, that all the kids will be abductees, although some Abduction researchers think that only some of the kids will be abductees. In my experience, all of them are, but I'm saying most likely. The question then, who is abducted? Do people have any special characteristics? Yes. They're human, and their mother or father was an abductee. That's it. It's, it's the good, the bad, the innocent, the guilty. It's everybody and anybody. It's uh, how many times are people abducted? People will tell me, you know, I was abducted once in 1984. I'll never forget it. It was I was in a uh, field and blah, 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 blah. The answer is, that's an interesting concept. Let's see what happened. And then they remember some other odd thing that happened. Then they remember another one, then 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 another one. All the way back into childhood. Now, they stop remembering when kids don't remember, like at four or five or whatever. It's harder and harder to remember when you have anything of note when you get uh, that young. But we know that parents are abducted with their babies. Therefore, there's a pretty good reason to think that it goes from infancy into old age. It stops somewhere in old age, and we don't know where. We don't know when it stopped or what time. So people are abducted with great frequency over and over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, I had a guy come to me with 200 incidents that he had written down that might possibly be abduction activity. 200, he was 40. That meant only five a year from the time he was born. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Five a year is, not an, is too little. I've never, I've never had five a year when I started doing one of these. It's much more. So people are abducted all the time. It is anybody and everybody. It is intergenerational. It's global. That's really a critical one. It's global. It's around the world. I get email from abductees around the world. It does not matter. They have 
There's two things that they have to be able to do which limits it. They have to have a computer, they have to find my website, and, uh, which, is, which is not easy, and, um, and they have to understand English so they can fill out the questionnaire. Hopefully we can get around that. There's something called Google Translate, which I've been using all the time now. It's wonderful. Um, no matter what language it is, Google will translate it. So, okay, so it began though, when we think back on it, if this continues, how long will it take for everybody to be an abductee? If it keeps spreading laterally through people who are abductees and getting married to non-abductees, and then it continues down through the generations, longitudinally, so to speak, how long will it take for everybody to be an abductee? I had a PhD mathematician work this out. Now the problem is I don't really know because I couldn't, rem I can't remember how many people he started with. But he said, I, I think he started with like a million or something like that, or maybe 500,000. He said seven generations. Now the question is what is a generation? The term generation has changed over the years. And when you look it up on Google, it is now 30 to 35 years, which seems like an awful long generation to me. But um, uh, let's just say it's 30 years. Because we used to think it was 20 years and it was boosted up to 25. Okay, that means, ladies and gentlemen of the now sleeping audience, that means that um, if this phenomenon started in 5000 BC, as some people claim, by 3000 BC, everybody on the planet would have been an abductee. And if it started in the 14th century, by the 17th century, everybody would have been an abductee. See what I mean? And we know that two to five percent of at least Americans and probably the global population are abductees. Therefore, it couldn't have started very long ago. And here's the kicker. We have reports from both before 1947, before Kenneth Arnold. We have reports from the early 1940s that we've examined. I've looked at cases from the 1930s. Bud looked at one case from the early 1920s. And there's evidence, there's, there's anecdotal evidence of going back to the 1880s that I have. So we say the last part of the 19th century is probably okay. Um, hang on a second here. This thing is checking for updates. It's still checking for updates. Go away. Cancel. It's not letting me cancel. <laughs> Help. Oh, well, we'll talk without this for a second. But uh, we do, I do need somebody to come down and, uh, here he is, <laughs> materialized out of nothing. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right. <laughs> Give that man a hand. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I've lost my train of thought. The point is, though, that that uh, it, it goes back to around the last quarter of the, of the 20th century. I won't go into all the evidence. The time, 14 minutes are remaining. <laughs> I've got a <laughs> prompt here is telling me that. Okay, next. Let me speed along here. Okay, this is a phenomenon that is secret. Without secrecy, there would be no abductions. If people knew about this phenomenon, and they remembered everything, and everybody knew about it, we'd find a way to stop it. That cannot be done. That's not going to happen, and you cannot allow that. It must remain secret, and it is. We see maybe 1% people who know that it's happened to them who come forward to me or to other uh, hypnosis specialists in this. and. Um, we, we don't see 2% of the American public coming forward. It's just not going to happen. They don't know they're abductees. Uh, so, but without it, there wouldn't be an abduction problem, uh, program, that period. So you have to have memory blockage in order to maintain secrecy. In order to maintain secrecy, the first person you've got to keep it secret from is the abductee, obviously. And there's invisibility involved with this. When people are floated out their windows or out their walls or wherever they are, people are standing around outside sometimes. I had some guy that was abducted around 1 o'clock in the afternoon from his college dorm right through the old campus, and there were students walking around. He could see them down there who did not see him. 
I, even now it galls me. I'm the first person that ever used the word invisibility in an abduction talk that I did in 1991. And, uh, but, and even it still makes me choke up a little bit in terms of, uh, should I say that word or should I just say the word unseeable? It's such a better word and it goes down easier. In fact, it's all part of the secrecy program. Then there's the human concept of the unlikelihood of flying saucers from outer space visiting here. We're just a little planet in a corner of the galaxy. Of course, that means that they know about other Earth-like planets that are bigger in the center of other galaxies that would draw more attention. It's a kind of a nutty way of thinking. Uh, but, um, but there's also a lack, especially of abductions, of hard evidence that we have. We have anecdotal evidence, stories people tell through human memory, retrieved through hypnosis with all its problems, administered by amateurs of the most important thing that's ever happened in the history of humankind. Obviously, the, 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 the response is to simply not believe it, and probably correctly so. We have not figured out a way to, to, to get anybody to believe that this is happening, except the scientists who are themselves abductees. Now, now we come to the, we're still 11 minutes left, we're still, Aliens make mistakes. Here are a few examples. Abductees are brought back to the wrong place. They're brought back wearing uh, their clothes uh, um, wrongly. Uh, sorry, according to the LY should be there. They re they're returned wearing their, to their regular environment wearing someone else's clothes. If you want to wake up one morning and you're wearing somebody else's clothes, I think you'd remember that. You know what I mean? It might be a shock. I, I don't know. Um, while driving in a car, people have put back on the wrong side of the road. I had one guy who gave up driving. He found himself with cars headed directly towards him. He had to f zoom off to the, to the curb. He was headed in the wrong, it put him down the wrong place. That's an error. People get loose on board and run down the hallway. People get loose and, and uh, one guy reached up and grabbed this, this alien's neck who was, started to squeeze him and was staring at him. He got loose while, it was the, while neural engagement was taking place. Um, Abductees are returned outside their houses that are bolt locked. How the heck? What? They, they're in their yard. One woman had to use a baseball bat to smash through her patio glass doors to get inside her house. <laughs> People remember things. They shouldn't remember things. And they don't. 95%, 99% of them don't remember anything. They live weird lives. They see ghosts, they see religious figures, they travel on the astral plane, they have this, they have that. And they know, and that, that's, that's normal for them, you know, uh, but, but they, they, they lead odd lives. Are they abductees? Hell no, they would say to me. <laughs> Hell no, and I'm not an abductee. Um, and sometimes abductions are witnessed by others. Not only that, which I should add, but people are abducted in groups, and uh, if you're interested, and they can confirm each other's abductions, and, uh, and they're physically missing from their normal environments when they're abducted. When you tell a psychiatrist that people are abducted in groups, they will simply ignore what you said because everything that they've held dear and cherished in their lives will be destroyed if they were to believe you. <laughs> now, this is the air raid. If this phenomenon began in the 1880s, whatever, one would expect that this is a first time situation that the errors would be higher at that time as the ab abductors is the aliens got used to us and got the kinks you know, removed, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what you would see in those days is somebody falling from the sky, you know, uh, took a misstep on their way back or something, and down he comes when there's no place to jump from. And, uh, uh, or, or you would see all sorts of mistakes. Flying saucers will be crashing over New York City. That's where a lot of abductees live, you know. I mean, they, they, uh, the abductions take place where there's lots of people, usually, because there's, uh, abductees are packed in. And, um, and so if, if this was their first attempt at hybridization, one would expect more errors. What we see 
is a narrow range, a low range of errors that from the beginning to the end. A low range. Steady. Now we return to the reptilians. I think we return to the reptilians. I'm going to have to. I have seven minutes left. Here are insectilians. Let's return to the insect ones. They're thin. They have mouths, nose, ears. Uh, mouths, nose, noses, and ears are not reported by abductees. They're order givers. They appear to be the ones in charge. Physiological aspect of the gray. Small, thin, hairless, slit for mouth, no, uh, holes for nose. Do not breathe, do not ingest food, do not talk, probably do not smell. Gray's physio physiological anomalies. Why do they have a nose, mouth, and, hole, and ear holes? Also, the aliens have no interest in human, uh, in Earth's institutions. Absolutely nothing. No interest in religion, government, sociological aspects of it. They have no academic interest in political science, history, mathematics, sciences, anthropology, psychology, literature, entertainment, and so on. And um, this is not necessarily true of hubrids, uh, but, uh, but this pretty much for the ones, other ones. The intergenerational aspect means that this phenomenon is spreading throughout the society. The workers, not in order of their importance, are insectilins, tall grays, reptilins, small grays, we've been through this. Abductees are at the, at the bottom, we'll explain that in a minute. Each worker has an, a function, they're smoothly carried out, they're efficient in their division of labor, they're goal-directed, they're long-lived, we think. I'm sorry, the program is long-lived, they may be long-lived as well. Uh, here, the reason I figured out and this is where it's just pure speculation, is that they, these beings have done this before. Now you look at the reptilins. They're doing the same jobs as everybody else. They're part of the workers program. They're no different from what I can tell. One abductee, and when you have one, you just, but I'll tell you it anyway, because this woman was amazingly precise and especially careful in what she remembered, was told once, and this is already, you have to be very careful of anything told by aliens because people can fabulate all over the place, uh, that some beings were products of previous hybridization attempts. And uh, they didn't say anything about reptiles. Like they, they don't know the word rep, yeah, reptile. That, that's not in their, in their thought processes. And, but my sense is, is that that's what the reptilians are. That they're doing uh, the aliens' bidding. They were from somewhere else, not from here, because you know it's hard to it's hard to mate a an alligator with a human. You know, it's, it's a, you, you, same thing with a chimpanzee. You, you know, there, there, there's there's one three percent difference in the genes, and and you just cannot create a a, a an offspring with a chimpanzee. You know, I, I've tried and tried and tried and. <laughs> just doesn't work. So, what you get here is routinization. Everyone has a function. Beings are hybridized for functions. Next. Now we come into hypothetical perspectives. The insectilins are the only non-hybridized aliens. That's a guess, but it makes some sense. The reptiles were created from a previous hybridization program. If this is true, you cannot make the case for three advanced species in the galaxy. In other words, if you say we are the only advanced technological species in the galaxy, like the rare earth theory, theory, you have to ignore the UFO phenomenon altogether. If you say, OK, there's just us and the aliens, well, maybe there are just two. But if there's another group, like the reptil reptilians, you cannot say there's just three. Because if you say there's just three, you're saying there's just three trillion. <laughs> you can't say there's just three. It makes no sense. It is illogical. The universe is teeming with life. There, the galaxy is teeming with, with terrestrial, uh, with, with advanced technologically uh, life. Three is an unsupportable number. Two is on the cusp. One, probably not. See what I mean? It, it, it has to, therefore, the galaxy is teeming with life. New perspective number two. If the insectilins, the reptilins, and the grays and humans are hybridized and their error rate is the same now as when they began, 
and the grays, maybe I forgot to tell you this, are probably the result of, an, of early hybridization with humans. That's the reason why grays have this mouth and nose and ears that they shouldn't have. This is really early stage hybrids, <laughs> really early stage hybrids, but it's on a continuum. It makes sense in terms of what we're looking at. Because what these insectolins did, they came here and they just created their own workforce. They didn't have to bring people over from the planet Vortec or whatever it is. They, they just created their own workforce. Everything is absolutely logical in, this, in these beings' world. Two plus two equals four. It's everything that we thought was crazy, insane, nutty. How can we ever figure this out? With enough information, we've been able to figure out. It's logical. They just say, oh, yeah, that makes sense, and you go on to something else, even though five minutes before you realize you thought it was totally crazy, and then eventually you learn what it's about, and it makes sense. Everything, it has to be that way. It has to be that way because they've got extremely advanced technology, and two plus two equals four, no matter where you are, I think, I guess, I assume. I'm not real good in higher mathematics, but my assumption is that two plus two equals four most everywhere. So everything they do seems like routine. There should have been more errors. There aren't, there weren't, there isn't. Their secrecy program is fantastically successful. Their ability to deal with human neurology and physiology is amazing. They know what they are doing. So, if this is all true here, it has the following meanings. Hybridization is a means to an end. They're doing this for a reason. This is an integration program into the society. Everything points to this, and nothing points away from it. Everything points to an integration, including what they tell abductees. Everything points to it. If they're doing so well with us, that means that hybridization for at least one group uh, is a routine way, left out another word there, of taking over a planet. If you want to take over a planet, this is how you do it. You have all the time in the world, You've uh, got all the workforce you need in the world. You've got all the technology that you need. You can actually do that, which is inconceivable to us, but that is where the evidence leads. If this is the case, hybridization is common. We're part of a common routine that has been done before, God knows how many times, but we're just part of this, of this routine, routinized phenomenon of hybridization that we're standing by idly watching. So it is happening to us, my guess is. Now, I wanted to show you a picture of a hybrid. I still have a few minutes remaining. This, I'm not sure of this picture because all pictures, they look like just common people. And you know, if you show a picture of a common person and the person never gets wind of it, they sue you for all your worth. <laughs> so you can't, you can't do that. The hybrids, uh, hubrids look just like us, but I do have a picture here, I, I believe. <laughs> and I think that guy is one. <laughs> okay, that's my story and I'm sticking to it.